You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. News, views, and interviews in association with FE News. Good evening, all. Have you popped down the garden centre today? That's right, folks. For those of you out there with those green fingers, today was the first time since lockdown you could head over to the Jolly Green Giant and purchase a sack of compost. And don't worry if planting geraniums is not your thing because we've got 60 glorious minutes ahead of us to debate the topics making waves on the only dedicated FE community radio show in the world. The program is now attracting so many listeners, people may soon have to start socially distancing their handsets, just to make sure that my dulcet tones don't spark a backlash of civil unrest. On tonight's show, we've got a stellar lineup of lovies, experts and sector leaders, as we first broadcast on National Numeracy Day. That's right, today. But tonight, we are all about the arts and sciences. Should there even be such a divide? Why do we seem to celebrate those taking STEM subjects like our chemists, engineers and doctors, yet quietly we sneer at those who just want to be the next, Grace and Perry? And what about the wannabe radio DJs like me? Without the kind sympathy of the show's editor, Kelly O'Mara, there would be no outlet for my frustrated creative side to go. Stay tuned, folks, for the British Academy boss, who has a lot to say about the false divides between the humanities and natural sciences. I'll be talking to a legendary record mogul, the smooth operator himself, who not only produced Sade's 1984 Diamond Life album, oh, I remember it well, but he sits as a board member at the Institute for Apprenticeships. I'll be checking out the scientific views of tonight's big debate theme with the principal of Milton Keynes College, as well as catching up with the playwright producer and regular Sky News paper reviewer, Mo Lovett. But first, let's find out what's making the news headlines in the world of FE this evening. Six major education unions appear to be on a collision course with ministers after it emerged they were demanding changes to the government's COVID-19 recovery plan. The unions are demanding some adjustments and guarantees before educational settings like FE colleges would be deemed safe, they said, for staff and students to return on the 1st of June. The Department for Education had issued guidance earlier this week setting out an expectation that Years 10 and Year 12 students would be able to combine remote learning with tutor contact time from next month. The GMB, Unison, University College Union, National Education Union and Unite have all signed a statement setting out five key tests that they believe should be met before it would be considered safe for a wider reopening of colleges to take place. The union's demands include a national social distancing plan, reductions in the coronavirus-related death rates and some guarantees that college staff will be safe. In other news, as the government unveils more of its plans and guidance in an effort to reopen schools, Teaching Abroad Direct has surveyed over 1,400 teachers to see how the pandemic has affected their employment. The survey found almost one in four teachers have been furloughed or had contracts cancelled as a result of the virus. Supply teachers have been worst hit with 82% out of work or on furlough. Two in every five teachers admit... They are financially worse off. And finally, students at Uxbridge College have donated 1,000 bottles of hand sanitizer to local care homes and health services. The students wrapped the small gifts, including chocolate bars, and gave them to staff at Wexham Park Hospital, as well as to Queen Mary's Maternity Unit and Intensive Care Unit at West Middlesex University Hospital. A number of the students have parents and relatives working at the hospitals. Local NHS staff made a video for Oxbridge College, pictured with their special guest, as a way of saying 
Thank you to these kind and thoughtful FE students. That's all your Skills World news from fenews.co.uk. Contact us at Skills World Live. Email skillsworld at fenews.go.uk. Follow us on Twitter at Tom Buick at FE News. Use the hashtag Skills World. Call us on 02032 900 treble one. That's 02032 900 treble one. Vivera with Anya Gold. And I think that's the first time that track has appeared on Skills World Live, taken, of course, from the musical annals of EpidemicSound.com. Now, tonight's big debate is on the theme of, in the future, will the British economy rely on having more scientists or creatives? have to say, this debate always slightly perplexes me. At what point in Western thought and history did such a divide take place? I remember visiting the Leonardo da Vinci Museum in Florence just a few years ago, reading some of the master's notebooks and being instantly struck by the fact da Vinci was both a great artist and an accomplished scientist. His famous sketch of Vitruvian Man, for example, is a masterpiece of art, physiology and mathematics all rolled into one. Benjamin Franklin was another great polymath of his age. 
not only one of the framers of the American Constitution and a political philosopher, but he was also an early pioneer of electricity, winning in 1753 a medal from the Royal Society for his scientific works. And in case you were thinking the Renaissance and Enlightenment were just the preserve of men, then you clearly have not heard of Hildegard of Bingen, who was the revered female polymath and scientific discoverer of the medieval age. Or the author, Helen Keller, who was born both blind and deaf, yet still managed to churn out over 20 books and co-founded the American Civil Liberties Union. All these great individuals did not allow themselves to be defined as artists or scientists. What they were often looking for was on a scale of what William Blake saw as beauty or what Charles Darwin would regard as the search for objective truth. In short, the human insights that can come from all of us, just being inquisitive and experimental. Fast forward to the 21st century, And it appears we have lost some of the curiosity of that bygone age. Maybe it was the 19th century Fordist model of mass production and universal basic education that has taken us in this direction. Students are organised in batches as they pass along an age-related, subject-defined curriculum, like different motor vehicle models running along a production line. Educators often use clichés like think outside the box, while continuing to organise pedagogy and curricula that defines people by precisely putting them back in their boxes. Labels like art student or STEM pupils. What does all this really mean? And when these labels are applied to the labour market, we see how the gulf opens up between those who advocate economic salvation by the UK making more things, including the pursuit of natural sciences, and those who think Britain's post-imperial future is best devised by supporting our creative industries, particularly as they operate globally, building a new empire of the mind. In official government policy, we've lost it, it seems, the art of nuance. The Orga Review, for example, made a very deliberate pitch for more investment in science, technology, engineering and maths, or STEM, education. Indeed, Dominic Cummings, the Prime Minister's chief strategist, no less, has made no secret of his desire to make the UK a world powerhouse in educational science. Meanwhile, those like my special guest on tonight's show point out how both humanities graduates and those with STEM degrees equally contribute to a dynamic British economy founded on both scientific invention and creativity. After this short musical break, I'll be talking to Hetan Shah, the boss of the British Academy, I'll be examining a major piece of research he commissioned only last year, which found that despite some of the tabloid headlines of art students heading straight for the doll queues, the employment rate for humanities and social science degree holders was almost exactly the same as it was for STEM graduates. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be kicking off tonight's big debate after another popular track from our favourite Swedish house music artist, Thomas Skidelberg.
Thomas Skielberg and Celebration of Life. Indeed, we celebrate all things life on this show. Now, to kick off tonight's big debate on this uh, STEM versus STEAM debate, I'm delighted that He Tan Shah, who's the Chief Executive of the British Academy, has uh, agreed to join us. Good evening, Mr Shah. Hello. Hello. Thanks uh, for coming on Skills World Live. Now, let's start with this um, more philosophical question I was sort of trying to address there just before the break. I mean, at what point, Hitan, do you think Western society started making such a hard and fast distinction between the arts and humanities and the, uh, the natural sciences anyway? Well, I think uh, Western society is probably too broad, isn't it? I, I mean, uh, we, we, we do it in the, in the UK and there's, uh, there's the kind of uh, famous essay by know uh, of the two uh, sort of, uh, you know, the two faces and the two disciplines, as it were. Whereas if you look in, for example, Germany, uh, they've got a word which I can't quite pronounce, but Wissenschaft, something like that, right. which means sort of systems of research or systems yeah. of thought. Uh, and they don't make that sort of a distinction. So uh, I don't think it, you know, the, the sort of two cultures idea runs through the whole of the West, as it were, but right. uh, there is there is a bit of a legacy of that in the UK. Okay, well, I stand corrected. Obviously, it's probably more of a, an Anglo-Saxon thought than uh, Anglo-Saxon Western thought, as opposed to uh, the whole of the West, as you say. Now, look, um, in the report you commissioned from uh, London Economic last year, you found that arts, humanities and social science graduates were just as resilient to economic upheaval as their STEM counterparts. The employment rate, for example, was, I think, different by just 1%, with 89% of STEM graduates employed in 2017 and humanities grads recording um, an 88% employment rate in the same year. I mean, do you think a finding like that really debunks a lot of myths out there about the value of sort of arts and humanities courses versus STEM courses at university? I think it does. I think there's been a bit of a perception that, you know, some of these arts, humanities, social science courses and uh, don't make you as employable. Uh, but actually, I mean, you know, that our research didn't just look at that one year. We looked across 20 years and found that arts, humanities, social science graduates were just as likely to be as employed as STEM graduates all the way through, including, for example, after the, you know, the 2007-8 financial crash. So there's a kind of resilience there uh, and, uh, you know, also they're more likely to be employed in a far greater range of industries and roles than their STEM counterparts. So, I mean, it just casts some light on, uh, as you say, uh, it kind of debunks uh, what's perhaps a bit of a lazy myth. And I think people sometimes forget we're an 80% services economy yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's a knowledge-based and a creative economy. And so it's not really a surprise when you think about it that, that, that those skills should be in demand. Sure. And indeed, the creative industries take them combined is uh, well over 12% of GDP, or at least it was before COVID-19. Now, look, so as you're saying, in terms of employment rates then of STEM and humanities grads uh, over that longitudinal sort of period of time, you do find uh, a lot of similarities. But what do you say, though, to those studies, other studies like uh, from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, for example, that found in 2018 that five years after graduation, creative arts students, it's based on wage data, but they're, um, you know, on average, they're, they're earning 25% less than other graduates, not only just STEM ones, but in relation to other graduate disciplines, 25%. But I less. think well, well, one of the most important things here is that money isn't everything, right? Sure. So the, the biggest motive for university uh, is interest in the subject. Uh, and higher salary is actually comes in fifth place. Uh, you know, sort of 34% of people are motivated by that. So uh, I think one of the things that's really important kind of uh, as a finding from our research is that young people who are thinking about what should I go on to do at university should feel they can study what they love and they can still have a great career ahead of them. Now, if money is important to you, you can choose uh, a subject that you like. I mean, that that might be a STEM subject, uh, but equally, if you're an arts, humanities, social science person, you might want to go into law or economics. I mean, these are phenomenally well-earning subjects as it were so Mm. you know uh, there's horses for courses yeah and as you say um there are in some ways perhaps more occupations more sectors that uh 
arts, humanities, social science graduates can potentially go and work in than there are for their STEM counterparts? I mean, your research found that, didn't it? Well, one of the really interesting bits of uh, findings in our research was that eight of the ten fastest growing sectors in the UK economy employ more arts, humanities and social science graduates than any other discipline. Right, yeah. uh, and in fact, six out of ten of them have got two thirds or more arts and humanities, social science graduates. So what that starts to suggest is that the direction of where the economy is going you know, what the future economy will look like, uh, that there's more and more demand for these skills. And again, I think, you know, if you think with the increasing rise of automation, that the things that are hardest to automate are creativity, innovation, uh, oral communication. Uh, and these are the sorts of things, actually, that you know, if you look at the 2018 UK Engagement Survey, Arts, Humanities, Social Science graduates were much more likely to say their degree prepares them for those sorts of areas than their STEM counterparts were likely to say that. Yeah, indeed. And you go back to that first question, you know, more sort of philosophical one, and what I was discussing about perhaps false divides. I mean, what is a sort of STEM company versus a creative company anyway? I remember visiting uh, BMW in Germany a few years ago, for example, and, you know, talking to the CEO there, and there was as much investment going into the, you know, the sort of design uh, department that was obviously uh, designing new models. There was lots of uh, investment in everything from a clothing range all the way through to the marketing and the promotion, because as the boss of that company said to me, yes, there's a foundation in great engineering but also their competitive edge in the marketplace both you know Germany but importantly globally uh, was you know it was all about creativity it was about lifestyle it was about experience that's what they were selling to their customers I mean do you identify with that in terms of what the British Academy is about and what you do with your students? Yeah, no, well, uh, I, I totally agree that, uh, you know, the, the, the boundaries between some of these things are blurring. And in, in the world of industry, I mean, uh, you talked about, you know, uh, the games market before, mm. uh, which is worth, you know, close to four billion now, I think, in, in our economy. Yeah. Obviously, they'll have plenty of computer yeah. scientists there, but yeah. they'll have many, many creators too. Uh, I mean, in terms of the British Academy, where we are the National Academy for humanities and social sciences but we work very closely with you know the royal society which is the same for science the royal academy of engineering uh, which you know does what its uh, name suggests and the academy for medical sciences so mm. we work really closely together to uh, and for example all four of us are working together on how we respond to the pandemic at the moment yeah, uh, and sure. each of us yeah. is playing to our respective strengths. And yeah. it's when you I bring mean, all those disciplines together that yeah. you get real power. Absolutely, because you've got epidemiologists coming together with behavioural psychologists, coming together with you know, economists as well, who are also looking at the impact of the pandemic on uh, the economy as a whole. So, and, and that, of course, is all feeding into you know, the government's policy-making process. Now, look, a final question uh, for you, Hitan. I mean, I'm bound to ask it, aren't I, given... Uh, the fact of just where we are right now with this terrible coronavirus crisis. I mean, how how relevant now do you see that research, some of its findings, um, OK, albeit longitudinally, but published just last year? What would you expect to see really change and impact on arts and humanities, social science graduates and people in the industry more generally as a result of COVID-19? Well, I mean, the, as we know, uh, the higher and further education sectors themselves are changing massively. So in that sense, students going through the system will find, you know, life is going to be different. There will be much more focus probably on online courses, et cetera, in the short run. But I think the other really interesting thing is that this is a moment for social imagination. And it's those disciplines that arts, humanities and social sciences have that allow us not just to understand the world, but to reimagine it, because we are at a moment, a kind of pivot point in our society where we're recognising, you know, uh, the pandemic's uncovered a lot of inequalities, uh, a lot of other issues that have been there in our society. And lots of people are asking, how do we put our society back together in a way that is better than it was before? Yeah, and and just briefly, this is a bit off off topic, but obviously, uh, as a leader of a of a major higher education institution, I mean, uh, do you see as a result of some of the challenges, you know, financial pressures, overseas students, all of that? Do you 
could see some kind of shakeout or restructuring of the tertiary education system and by that obviously I include further education colleges and universities I mean is that something one could expect to see over the next few years uh, I, I think it's utterly inevitable uh, but I couldn't tell you what the, sure. what the future will look like uh, you know, there, yeah, yeah I, I mean the government's made it clear that it does want some changes uh, but hasn't yet specified what those will look like uh, so I think that remains to be seen. But it's very clear that, that we're likely to see a large drop-off of uh, international student income, uh, and the, the, the university system certainly relies upon that for a cross-subsidy. So that, that just changes the model uh, quite significantly. I'm sure it will. Hitan Shah, Chief Executive of the British Academy, thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. That was called Hot Thang by Dan Friedel. I think we played one of his funky tracks uh, on one of the shows last week. Now, despite my best efforts to get in touch with the smooth operator, he's not picking up his phone. So Robin Miller, CBE, if you're listening to the show, give me a call and I'll try and patch you into the studio. But joining us is Dr Julie Mills, OBE, who's Chief Executive and Principal at Milton Keynes College. Good evening, Julie. Uh, good evening. Hi, thanks very much for having me on. 
Well, thank you for for joining us and um, you know, giving up some of your evening for <laughs> connecting the world of FE. Now, no uh, problem. <laughs> Judy, um, I've I've thought a lot about tonight's big debate theme, and um, you know how how does a sort of college like yours position itself along this perhaps rather false but STEM versus STEAM debate? Well, I mean, you mentioned in your intro, uh, Tom, about kind of the artificial divide, um, and, and you know you kind of brought to life Leonardo da Vinci and some of the, the historical yeah. greats, and and I think that's um, that's a really important thing because for us, there's there's kind of different strands to this um, this debate. I mean, clearly the creative industries are significant in their own right. We just heard a, quite a bit about that from from the previous. Um, uh, caller yeah, return, yeah. um, and you know that they have economic value and being a designer or a performer has value and, and not least to the people who who consume the outputs and 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 see that that work but also the skills developed through those creative um, programs or humanities programs are highly transferable to to all sectors and all industries and I was really interested to hear Hetton talk about the range of industries that the arts and humanities graduates work in and I think that that kind of demonstrates that transferability and then for us what's really important is that whole thing around creativity um, in the context of problem solving in novel ways is it should be an essential element of any discipline so there's kind of like the specialist bits which motivate those people who want to to work in those industries but there's that transferable um, importance and certainly the, the employers that we work with across all sectors would rate the ability to think creatively to problem solve to bring novel ideas um, to play as, as being amongst the most important skills that they're looking for whatever the role I mean, the the town or you know, the city where your college is of course famously is one of the new towns wasn't it that was built uh, mm. in the post-war period i mean how how has that local kind of um, tradition and culture shaped your curriculum offer and you know, the values within your institution? I mean, there, there is certainly quite a strong pioneering culture across the community. Um, and most residents are newcomers to um, to Milton Keynes, to the UK in many cases. So it's a really rich and diverse population. Um, and young people in particular are used to working with and growing up with people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And I, I think that's a really good foundation for thinking creatively, for, for being open minded, for, you know, for allowing yourself to consider other ideas and other ways of doing it. Um, and in, in a practical sense, we have a huge number of entrepreneurs. I think there are some stats around the number of patents coming out of Milton Keynes yeah. being statistically significant. So there, yeah. there's definitely that enterprising spirit. And yeah. I think creative um, creativity generally is, is, is the essence of that invention and inspiration. So a lot of the work that we do is, is really about breaking down the boundaries between the traditional kind of academic perceptions of here's the arts community, this is culture, this is engineering, this is science and really looking at where through collaboration and and real work and project work and teamwork you just can bring out the creative aspects of of all of all elements indeed milton Keynes, named after two economists who uh, have very <laughs> differing perspectives you could say on the same subject so uh, actually named after one of the medieval villages at its core but but we'll yeah. take the economics anyway <laughs> well, Keynes so. is certainly making a comeback at the moment isn't he he certainly is uh, yeah and some of his ideas I think will be needed when you look at uh, some <laughs> of the figures coming out. Talking of policy, um, and obviously you're a leader within the FE sector, the Augur Review. Now, um, you know, I think there were many felt sort of having read that that it was very much an anti kind of arts and creativity report in some ways because Augur himself, you know, really went big on the need to invest in STEM. In fact, you know, he he pointed yeah. out the difference in investment between. STEM subjects and and non-STEM subjects, and of course you've got people like um, Dominic Cummins, you know the the uh, Prime Minister's chief strategist, who again is on record talking about the need to invest more in educational science. So so that debate's very live and active, and there are some very influential people, not least Baroness Wolf as well, who's advising the Prime Minister. I mean, does that concern you slightly that that, that you know, perhaps it's still going to be a bit of an uphill battle to convince policymakers of the worth of the value of creative subjects? I think um, our sector is has kind of has a history of of, um, of being a bit at the whim of what what's popular in terms of, of subjects and and the perception that that um, you know unless you're 
on a training program that directly leads directly to a specific job there's something not quite right about it but actually that for me is where the voice of employers is so powerful and yeah. so strong um, large and small but particularly some of the, the bigger more influential employers who do yeah. have the ear of government and policy makers talk really eloquently about the importance of those um, creative skills and actually the benefits of, of somebody that's been through a, 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 an arts or humanities or creative sure. program um, and I, I think one of the um, one of the things that we really see is the ability of students who have had a, been on the creative courses that they really can receive and give objective, constructive feedback in a way that is so much more mature than a number of other other students on other programs. And I, and I think that's something which in the workplace is hugely valuable, and employers yeah. recognise that. Yeah. So my um, plea would be: let's, uh, as a sector, use the voice of our employers to engage in those policy debates yeah. um, and I, I think that's something which we can you know have more influence with great dr judy mills thanks for joining skills world live actually it looks like uh, robin miller may be able to join us but um unfortunately oh, i'll i'll have to uh, call off with you to, to <laughs> answer with him so we'll speak soon thank you so much for joining us thank you so much bye is that robin miller it is Robin, you're live on Skills World Live. Uh, so, uh, good evening. <laughs> good evening. Um, now, look, uh, Robin, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, uh, I mean, as a producer, you've had to combine the art of making music with the science of sound engineering, I guess, all your life. I mean, do you think this modern obsession with STEM education and producing more STEM graduates is, is helpful? Uh, out of context... Um, um, that sounds like a leading question, Tom. Yeah, I mean, it's just more in terms of, you know, obviously on the show tonight, we've been kind of discussing this whole issue of, and frankly, you know, my own view is I think there's a false divide between those who are in the arts and um, and those who are in the sciences. I think as history shows, often some of our geniuses and some of the biggest advances have been when people have combined those subjects, haven't they? You know, think of Leonardo da Vinci, think of Benjamin Franklin, you know, all these great characters great polymaths as well i mean from your own experience your own industry experience you know i'm sure you've had to combine both the the art of making music and in a sense there's also a bit of a science to it isn't there you sit on the sound desk yes i can i can answer that from from my experience and my perspective yeah quite clearly is that you know the old adage um one percent inspiration and 50 percent perspiration yeah. i slightly differ from that i'd say it's 50 50 Right. And I realized when I was training as a recording engineer and then watching great records being made by producers, I decided two things. First of all, that in order to be a great creator, you, the more you understood the science, the better. And the more you understood the skills and the crafts, the better. Um, but they were they were there to enable your imagination and your vision and your creativity to be brought to bear mm -hmm. and and the great example of that would be that john lennon and paul mccartney would sit in the studio and say george we would like this guitar to sound like it is from another world and be deeply unsettling and george would say then what i'd suggest you do is to record it turn the tape upside down plug it into another track record it backwards and um, then it'll sound like it, it's an envelope, you know, working in reverse. Yeah. So he was using his imagination first and then applying his knowledge and his scientific skills to that imagination to interpret the visions and the dreams. And yeah. I think I, I could apply that to a boardroom. You know, I could apply that to a, you know, the, the vision of a, of a, a group of uh, boardroom directors. Yeah, where you saying, always want to always say cross... we are, we are, you know, we, we would like to do this. We would like to create that. We don't know how to create that. And if you just give it to boffins who haven't had that experience of working with creative people, you may not arrive at the right result. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. No, I mean, at all. look, I mean, I think it's a it's a really fascinating insight because actually you've just nailed the reason why. 
perhaps this more utilitarian debate about we need more STEM graduates or we need more of this or less of that. Actually, it's about saying what we need is a, is a society, a dynamic economy where we cross-pollinate all these different skills and experiences to obviously take the country forward. You know, the creative industries, which are now what count for 12% of GDP, yeah. um, uh, you know, I mean, they're nearly as big as financial services, not quite as big as manufacturing. We do still have some yeah. sense of a manufacturing industry, but still, you know, a yeah. powerhouse globally. I mean, I talked to the, at the top of the show about how they helped forge in a post-imperial Britain, a sort of empire of the mind in many ways. If you think about mm. you know, the English language and the content that people want to consume from the mm. creative industries from around the world. I mean, a question obviously I'm bound to ask you, because just you know, where we are in still in partial lockdown and uh, you know, we're, we're working through the implications and the impact of this terrible virus i mean where do you see the future of the creative sector given just where we are now with um you know, the impact of of the virus i mean what would your thoughts and advice be for those that are perhaps just starting out in one of the creative industries where do you think they should I'm, go i'm loving it <laughs> okay I'm, sort of creative I'm destruction um idea no let it? me no. Let, let me explain okay. what i mean by that um uh the the streaming music part of our economy of our music sector is not really being affected in fact if anything for every restaurant and pub that can't pay to stream music there are people at home who's you know right. shown their mum yeah. and dad how Indeed. to how to stream music so that's yeah. all right but live music has fallen off a cliff. So yes. what I'm watching with fascination now is the artists and the performers trying to work out how to get paid to play their music live to audiences who won't be allowed to go and see them. And this is an amazing analogy, Tom, because mm. what's happened is that the live music people, the business people, rather than who, who don't really have a lot of creatives amongst them, are paralyzed. They're going, our venues are shut. Um, no one can, you know, no one can come. They'll only be half full. We can't work every other seat. It'll be horrible. We can't make any money. The, what's happened is that the tail has now said, well, we're going to wag the dog in that case. So the creators, the creatives, the artists, the musicians, the, the producers, the filmmakers are devising and inventing new ways of being able to provide an economic solution which appeals to punters by, mm -hmm. by all sorts of previously unknown and unheard of yeah, fascinating. Uh, means. Yeah. So we're going to see probably 15 years of innovation mm -hmm. collide, uh, concertina into six months now. Well, that, um, yeah, well, that will be fascinating to see that unfold. And, and you're right, you know, every major crisis results in one kind of innovation or another. Listen, I've, I've got less yeah. than a minute, but I just wanted to ask you, because, I mean, you've got many guises, and, of course, you know, you're know you from and of the music industry, but you're also on the board of the Institute for Apprenticeships. I mean, just a quick I'm thought. I've just come um, from a board meeting this afternoon. Right, OK, yeah. well, perhaps you could just share with our many FE listeners, many of whom will be involved in um, apprenticeships. What's the... Um, What's the view from the bridge then about where the uh, you know, the apprenticeship program might go in the future? Very top line. I think probably. it's. Um, I think everyone acknowledges that uh, employers are, are, are extremely distracted at the moment, yeah. and therefore taking on the next cohort of apprenticeships is going to be uh, a, a real challenge for all of us. Therefore. We need to be very flexible. We need to be very imaginative. Uh, we need to, because th we've got a responsibility to the country to make sure that we still upskill the right number of people to, you know, provide a, a, a good future. But it's going to have to be done in different ways. It's going to have to be done in more, more virtual, more imaginative, more clever ways and the mm. government is going to have to support it financially tom 
yeah. the government is going to have well, to bend uh, over backwards to say to employers yeah. and training providers, we're going to make this really easy for you. We're going to encourage you to take on people that need to be skilled, that need to be evaluated. We've got to keep the quality up, but we've got to get them out there and we will help you pay for okay. it. Well, um, Robbie Millett, no doubt on the 20th of May when we're going to debate the whole future of apprenticeships and indeed we've got the Chief Operating Officer of the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education coming on the show. We will expand. Is that Rob Nish? It is Rob Nish, yeah. He well, will, he's, uh, le- he's leading the way in a marvellous way. He's been outstanding. Great. Well, we'll have him on the show and we'll debate that whole subject with him. Okay. I'm sorry I was late coming on, by the way. That's My music computer uh, uh, just decided to let me down. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. Robin Miller, CBE, Chairman, Director, okay. Global Ambassador and Record Producer. Thanks for joining Skills World Live. Pleasure. Thanks, Tom. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. I told you every single time, don't you worry. You would always call me at the wrong time. So you can know what I was up to. Oh, don't you get that? It's just stupid. Don't need it. And the artist is Mind Me. It's a double act with Emmy. Now to continue and de close tonight's big debate theme, looking at the whole STEM versus STEAM, the whole issue of STEM graduates versus arts and humanities graduates. Not that it has to be a versus and either or. I mean, that's clearly one of the messages that's already come out from um, the contributors and guests we've had on the line. I'm delighted to be joined in this three-way debate now by Mo Lovett, who's a writer and researcher specialising in arts and culture, and Nick Ellens, who's the Chief Executive of Energy and Utility Skills 
uh, and that includes the National Skills Academy for Power. Good evening, both. Hello there. Hello, Hello, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Now, Nick, let's start with you. You've got over 30 years of experience working in an industry that absolutely needs the best scientific minds. Over that period, though, do you think all the focus on STEM subjects has actually really helped your sector? I think that the main thing for for our sector is, has been to have people with uh, employability traits. And that comes in all shapes and sizes. So if you take our, our sector for what it basically does, gas, power, water, waste management, so heat, light, power, sanitation, all those things, they're critical industries. They're heavily reliant on engineering and science. But vast aspects of what they do never even see engineering aspects so so we we tend to look at this whole subject and i think it's probably a bit of both because a lot of the 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 creativity the emotional expression the social relationships curiosity problem solving that we see in so many of the arts is absolutely critical the key point and a a couple of the speakers have touched on it tom is this to do what people are studying to do what and i think that's the that's the key for now is to try and work out so what is it we're trying to do which will then dictate where people come from and the skills they have. In our, in our sector, there's a vast blend needed of all sorts of skills. One part is critical engineering, but it is only one part. And the biggest, the biggest single salary job in the big utilities um, outside of the chief executive is director of regulation and economics. Right. That's interesting. So technically not uh, a STEM subject at all, um, but uh, mm. very interesting. Now, Mo, um, I mean, you've got uh, a background, obviously, in the creative industries. You've been a theatre uh, producer so i mean you're someone in a way that um you know you kind of talk the talk and walk the walk didn't you um but what do you say yeah. to those critics who point to the number of arts graduates and say you know frankly some of them should just get a real job and study something more scientific at college i mean have you ever come across that kind of prejudice in your career well the arts sector is quite quite a bubble so you tend to not you tend to hear yeah. that reinforced message that steam is you know that the arts need to be included in the stem subjects and yeah. have value in and of themselves i mean the arts is a funny um uh, kind of category in that it it straddles humanities and also more more kind of vocational creative and creative and cultural industries management more more kind of vocational um routes um through education as well so it, it always kind of straddles does that as as the industry itself does as well i mean the um dcms definition of um what the creative and cultural industries is is very broad you know there are 11 sub subcategories from advertising and marketing which yeah. is very much a kind of private sector to um dance and museums and galleries which are much more kind of reliant on public funding so it's a huge kind of area and obviously um we already know i think um that it, you know it, in the present with the lockdown it's a sector that has been um, um, inordinately um, uh, challenged by, um, you know, public venues closing, freelance workers who make up such a significant uh, proportion of the industry, little micro businesses, um, you know, it's having, having such a detrimental effect on on the industry and particularly at the kind of more publicly funded uh, end of the scale. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought Robin yeah. Miller's observation about obviously live music's fallen off a cliff at the moment so live yeah. streaming paid live streams back in a in a big way uh, at the moment <laughs> right. um yeah no, no, i mean i obviously want to ask you both this question but nick um in terms of you know your sector and your national skills academy uh and that will obviously include things like apprentices as well i mean you know, how do you see this crisis unfolding for a sector like energy and utility i mean are jobs going to go or is it a more resilient part of the economy do you think there's a there's a natural resilience to it in as much as the product it provides tom so you know as we step as we work now in our home working people have never been more reliant on the heat the connectivity yeah. of you know the, the it's broad all working bands as well which is great <laughs> absolutely I mean, you, I mean you get your moments of course we you know everyone gets their moments in that but yeah. but if you look at that core um that that's desperately needed now but as we go forward Despite the issues that are going on, there's nothing that indicates any more than people will need more of it. 
So, so I think from if, compared to many areas, I know, I know a number of the utility companies. I mean, the the pace at which they're working right now, because they are critical industries, right on the front line of this, is is so intense. But in many ways, it's a safe haven compared to some of the people we're hearing about on the call because of the type of roles they perform. So, we, so apprenticeships, people are still taking them on. They, there's a question over the start date, which is purely down to the social distancing point. But everyone's as committed as ever. Yeah. Uh, the utility sector was one of the first, in fact, was the first to get a, a standard signed off under the new English apprenticeship rules. Right. Um, one and a half thousand uh, endpoint assessments on the on the scientific technical side. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very committed to it, and and it's not going away. So okay. I think from that point of view, it's it's a big to us. But this point about the creative side, you know, constantly when I ask these people, what do you want as an apprentice? What's your absolute criteria? Yeah. And they always say the same thing, and it's attitudes and behaviours. Attitudes yeah. and behaviours is what they need. Indeed. Now, Mo, a last word to you because we've got to wrap up the show shortly. Um, I mean, when you look at the current crisis, and obviously you look at the, your your own industry, what what's kind of things would you like to see and particularly for the the arts and that could include obviously the subsidized sector as well as the commercial sector i mean obviously getting theaters open again is going to be a, a really important milestone but what else would you want to to see happen yeah, well, I mean, I'm an eternal optimist, and I, I, I do think that there's an opportunity. And this is, you know, this is a, this is kind of epoch changing, really, in a yeah. sense. And I think there's a, an opportunity for a creative upsurge. You know, in in, in a, a sort of the, it's going to affect everything. Narrative themes. You know, you can imagine plays on lockdown love trusts, or oh. you know, dance choreography Have you started writing that one on already? social it distancing. Like, yeah. You know, I've thought <laughs> you've got, about you've it. Got, you know? You've got the title. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you know the creative industries are creative and i think they can maybe respond the way they configure exhibition spaces use of outdoor spaces you know um we're going to use outdoor spaces more and we're going to want pleasant surroundings after we've been locked down you know creative cities and and public artworks and stuff so i hope it kind of at least with creative upsurge you know that's what i'm hoping for that's a really positive note to end this discussion on mo lovett writer researcher and nick ellens chief executive energy utility skills thanks so much for joining skills world this evening thank you Tom. thank you Tom. thank you you're listening to skills world live with tom buick got there with uh, all of our guests in the end this evening which is great some brilliant opinions as well and views and viewpoints that's what skills world live is all about and i was reminded today thinking about the show of that inspirational quote from uh, that great scientist and polymath albert einstein who said in 1929 i am enough of the artist to draw freely upon my imagination but imagination is more important than knowledge knowledge is limited Imagination, though, encircles the world. I'll leave you with purple limmies and some wave. So that's it, folks, for this particular show. Um, n- now, there won't be a live show tomorrow night. The um, Skills World live team will be having a night off. Alas, not raving anywhere in a nightclub. I mean, they're still closed. But we will be replaying the popular episode. Starts falling in apprenticeships? What's all the fuss about? And don't forget that if you want to be on the show, contact us, skillsworld at fenews.co. UK. Thanks as ever to the show's editor, Kelly O'Mara, and our digital producer, Belly Hansen. Skills World Live is an FE News production, supported 
by the Federation of Awarding Bodies Platinum Partners Programme. Goodbye. Subscribe to Skills World Live at fenews.co.uk forward slash skills world.